This, these two books I was just mentioning about um, sociocultural change of the, of the uh, uh, narrow Bushmen and also the Hansi Bushmen generally, because I, especially in the first book, um, I cover both the narrow and the Kalkaisi. The second book is on the narrow. Now, what about, I, I dealt with change and assimilation. And I want to talk about that a little bit because um, the there's some interesting points to it. Yes, they have changed in some ways. Um, uh, cash economy, the ca cash was introduced to them. Uh, wage labor was introduced to the Bushmen. Sedentism. A uh, number of Bushmen keep goats, goat herding. There were even a few with cattle. Um, donkeys, donkey carts, um, um, also different ways of hunting. They have dogs now. To, they have rifles, which uh, not every bushman owns a rifle. A rifle might be owned by one bushman, and then it's shared out. You know, in terms of the the old sharing uh, uh, process and networks, um, but. So there has been some change at the uh, kind of techno-economic level, and also uh, in terms of um, sort of socio-economic, uh, especially the wage labor. Um, a number of bushmen also in the area uh, where in interact with the Bantu-speaking people in terms of a patron-surf relationship. Uh, of paternalism, which is also a relationship some of the first generation Boers have with, with the Bushmen. That the Bushmen, a Boer farmer, a rancher, has uh, a number of Bushmen families in his employment who live in a little village attached to the residence of the, of the farmer. It's a kind of manorial system almost. And the uh, Bushman laborers that work for him and the f family, wives, children, grandchildren, grandparents, they all um, stay with the same Boer family over the generations. You know? So it's, 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 it's um, a form of um, uh, it's a manorial system of, of serfdom that <laughs> we had in Europe ages back, but <laughs> that's still there. And the Bushmen are, drawn, are sort of uh, drawn into this. But on the other hand, they, they have also retained a number of, of things. And th that's what I was more interested in, not so much the changes, but what resisted the changes, you know? Because I've been interested and kept that interest throughout my career in the resilience of the band society, of band society, as a uh, societal type, as a social formation, as a form of sociality, a form of political organization, or lack thereof, because they don't really, a la Pierre Claster, they're a society against the state. <laughs> so I'm interested in how what has happened to the band society that I studied that was subjected to extensive um, change, including um, being the entire people and the society they live in being absorbed in one gulp into this pluralistic stratified society. How much of the band structure ethos, ideology, has, has been retained. You know. And this is all the more interesting because, of course, the, this type of band society, um, which I'll talk about in just a second more, has 
ancient roots, right? I mean, we, we all lived in <laughs> this type of society. So it's been around for, forever in various forms, in various incarnations, and uh, oscillating change from very simple to complex, from egalitarian, acephalous without any leaders, to hierarchical, with strong leadership. So it, and yet throughout, it has retained a basic blueprint. And I'm interested in that blueprint. And I wanted to see what is that remaining blueprint. And one thing is that the band structure, the sharing is still very much, although it's now eroding, and I'll talk about that later. But when I was there, sharing was still very, 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 uh, established gender equality was still established um, was still very strong um, um, the um, certain forms of marriage the, the way people marry in a, in a very uh, resisted the European patriarchal model Bushman marriages were very very flexible very open there's a sort of trial marriage period when people experiment with different partners and then uh, they finally settle into a permanent ma marriage with more or less. <laughs> There's beautiful work on this but in, 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 um, in the book Nisa you know, by um, Mar Marjorie Shostak. Uh, so a lot of the institutions have remained. The sharing ethos was particularly strong. Um, and also the the basic blueprint of band society which i've uh, interested me a lot uh, and i've written a number of other things about it because that blueprint consists of basically three structures there's one sort of the the, the band group itself which is the basic society the default <laughs> social pattern Egalitarian, uh, a multi uh, multi-family, sibling-based, bilateral in terms of, of kinship, um, uh, with very loose political leadership, um, gender equality, um, loose composition. Uh, people come and go and intervisit. Uh, out adoption, in adoption. <laughs> Um, of children, um, but there are two other group groupings that also as, uh, establish a certain amount of um, autonomy at, for certain times of year. One is the the sub the the uh, family group itself that the band consists of. During the aggregation dispersal, you have the aggregation dispersal dynamic, right? The, uh, virtually all simple hunter-gatherers have that, where they will aggregate for part of the year in multi-family groups, the so-called, or even multi-band groups, and then they disperse in the in the wet season uh, amongst the bushmen. The Inuit have this too, a eh? mouse and mouse, there. and uh, um, uh, disperse into family groups that hunt and gather uh, in, uh, along different water holes uh, that are now full of water because of the rainy season. And then they, in the dry season, they re-aggregate again around, around the big permanent water holes. Well, this means that for parts of the year, I would, amongst the, in the Kalahari where I worked, uh, about four or five, six months, the group consists of small units family grouping. And on other parts of year, the year, in the dry season, or uh, protracted dry seasons, let's say you have a, a spell of drought, a drought spell for years on end, multi-band groups come together around very small number, maybe on, only one water hole left in, in several Nore, Nore are band territories. And then they may, for years, form band alliances, that's the term, uh, George Zibelbauer uses, or band nexuses, uh, Heinz's term, or uh, um, multi-band groups, which are capable, too, of existing as socio-political units 
for years on end. So you have potentially, you have three social formations here, each of which assume a certain degree of structural permanence and autonomy for various varying lengths of time from months to years on end. You know? So there is, this to me is why Bushman society is so flexible and resilient and adaptable, because it contains within it uh, the structural um, uh, organizational uh, um, makeup for a large number of people. And by the way, when the multi, uh, multi groups form, multi band alliances form, sometimes leadership develops there too centralized leadership, especially when these groups last for a long time, especially in a colonial setting when, when uh, encroaching settlers come from all over and try and, and uh, attack the people, try to drive them away, even genocidal attacks like the, command, uh, the terrible commando uh, system in South Africa and Namibia, um, as Robert Gordon has shown. Um, then these multi multi-band alliances can very quickly politically organize themselves under the leadership of a bellicose chieftain type figure. And there have been many such in the Cape in the 18th, 17th, 18th, especially in 18th, late 18th century, where these multi-band groups would politically organize become militarized even, develop a, a warrior tradition, a chieftain, a war chief. And then uh, when the crisis is over, revert back to the band, or even if another type of crisis, usually ecological crises, when there's a protracted drought or when things are so bad uh, that multi-band units can't be sustained, then you fi find that, for example, amongst the N N Bushmen of the Namib Desert in, w in western Namibia, where tiny groups of just family groups eke out a living precariously uh, for generations sometimes. You know? So to me, the, the key to resilience, why hunter-gatherer gr groups are so resilient, band society is so resilient, is because it has built into it social organization, uh, uh, organizational forms, formations that enable it to survive severe ecolog ecological pressure to cope with encroaching aggressors, which the Bushmen have had to do all the time um, from left, right, and center, in which case they mobilize politically, organize, militarize. And a number of the papers that uh, I've written uh, deal with the politicization of the Bushmen. For example, um, the uh, the one uh, 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 from foragers to miners and bands to bandits on the flexibility and adaptability of Bushman band society. Also, I have a in my in my sort of big book, <laughs> Tricksters and Transfers. Uh, I talk more about this. Again, uh, there is a whole section in there uh, uh, on that. And what interests me in particular is how, when they when the Bushmen are politicized in the context of aggressive settler encroachment, how leadership is sometimes assumed by a ritual person, ritual people, uh, trans dancers who, who uh, utilize their arcane, ritual, spiritual powers, translate them into political power. And uh, this has been, uh, is an idea that I found actually in my early work where I found that the trance dance, because of the existential stress people experience, trance dancing, which is basically a curing rite, and it's also uh, one of those Durkheimian rights of intensification, like a corroboree, you know, that, that really in galvanizes uh, social feelings of social cohesion, of integration, of solidarity. 
So these rituals have really increased in, in, in incidence and in intensity amongst the farm bushmen. Richard Lee and Lorna Marshall described them as much smaller uh, uh, events of maybe a band or two, you know, two, three dozen people. I've seen trance dancers of several hundred people, you know, and the trance dancers become rock stars almost, you know, and in the process they become professionalized, they accumulate wealth, they also accumulate political ambitions, and but I, what I found useful was sort of the kind of Linton, Wallace, you know, revitalization movement, nativistic movement, that, 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 that uh, device. And I found, uh, explained the rise in incidence of trance dancing and the increasing um, rationalization, professionalization, elaboration of the, the uh, mis mystical, arcane, supernatural aspects of, of, the, of the trans dance, the elaboration of all of that. Um, trans dancing, as described by Lorna Marshall and Richard Lee in amongst traditional Bushmen, is, is not that much of a ritual specialization. About two thirds of people can go into trance and trans heal at, with varying degrees of, of, um, of, of proficiency. But this is, amongst farm bushmen, trans dancing has become much more of a special ritual specialization. You know, only a few people know it. You have to, in fact, trans dancers now train their their apprentices. They're surrounded by retinue uh, of, of, of apprentices. They have their own singers, women who sing for them, their own song. So it's become a kind of professionalized and uh, uh, so much so that the trance dancer is seen by many of these farm bushmen as a, a potential leader. You know, in fact, uh, leadership sort of, um, even though many trans dancers are not interested in, some are, but mo most of them are sort of this, uh, you know, I'm a man of God. I'm, they, have, they don't have harbor uh, venal political ambitions, but some do, and so, and then some of the prehistorians in, in South, Afri South Africa, archaeologists who, who deal with prehistoric uh, Bushman sites uh, of the late Stone Age, where they see the intensification of leadership, of, of, of the, the, the increase in group size, in group complexity, and they correlate that with rock art that d depicts more and more trans dance scenes, either d directly or metaphorically. So they, they have made that correlation too. They, and, and in fact, Woodburn recently wrote an article too about leadership amongst hunter-gatherer groups uh, coalescing not around a, an economic figure, you know, the best hunter, the most skilled hunter, but around a ritual figure, the most skilled shaman, you know. So I've, I've written some things on that. Um, uh, uh, both, it started by observing the trans dance and its professionalization and political potential as it unfolded there in Khansi at the time I did my fieldwork. And then I have since looked at ethno-historical literature in Namibia and in Cape Town uh, about South African Bushmen and found that there is further corroboration for, for this, this view that leadership coalesces around a shaman rather than the hunter, <laughs> which is simplifying everything grossly. But, um, uh, some of my work in ethno-history has been on the, the politicization, including militarization of Bushmen. Um, uh, thereby activating the political potential in, in, in the shaman leader and the political potential for organization for complexity, structural complexity, including hierarchy in band society. Yeah. Another set of couple of papers I did on gender. Uh, 
which is interesting because Richard Lee and Lorna Marshall, again, these people, George Zuberbauer, who worked amongst traditional Bushmen, find that there is, and I found it too, that at in this socioeconomic sphere, there is gender equality, albeit the man has a bit of the a bit of an edge there. Man the Hunter, which was <laughs> Richard Lee's original, <laughs> as he regretted it, I think. <laughs> I don't know if you talked about that. <laughs> I mean, I've talked about it. About it. The, I mean, it, 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 because very quickly, f feminists <laughs> jumped on that. And women, Woman the Gatherer, Dahlberg's work, <laughs> book appeared as a in reaction to it. Anyway, but I do think uh, hunting gives and I've developed that too in, 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 in this book here, the my, my narrow monograph. There is a, I call power potential in the hunt, because not only is meat is a, is a very, very sought after food. People love meat, love the fat, which they need in these arid, well, you know this from the Arctic, right? <laughs> um, and there isn't much fat to be had because these animals, unlike the walruses and whales, are very lean except for one, the eland. And I'll talk more about the eland later. It's massively laden with fat. Anyway, so people crave meat. Animals are also very, very salient figures in myth and cosmology. In particular, the lion. The lion has about the same stature, mytho, poetically, mystically, symbolically, as does the polar bear amongst the Inuit or the jaguar in the Amazonia. The eland antelope stands for sex, for fat, for fertility. Uh, it's the source of potency. It's the, the divinity's favored animal. The incarnation of, of the divinity is in the eland. So animals are very, very prominent figures in, in myth, in ritual. In the imagination of people, people dream of animals, people talk about animals. The way we talk about sports or cars, they will talk about animal sightings, you know, that they've had. So much so, they can get so wrapped up in when hunters go out to, to hunt an animal by its strange behavior that they forget to shoot the arrow because they're so absorbed by the behavior of the animal. So animals are, uh, are very, prominent. So the, the hunters who deal with animals, as opposed to plants, yes, they are an important source of food, I agree. And Richard Lee is definitely right here. And they, they make up two thirds of the diet, if not more, depending on the time of year. But animals intrigue uh, the, the, the mind as much as the, the stomach. Plants only are for the stomach. <laughs> and so and hunters so deal with animals. So hunters, hunters also, unlike women gatherers, are only, they go out for a few hours a day and then they're back in the evening. Hunts go on for days, sometimes weeks. Hunters, because of open territories, non-territoriality, will often hunt in neighbor, neighboring nores, band territories, which requires uh, negotiation, uh, parleying, you know, with with the band, mem the the band that that is connected to that territory, so there is in the hunting in 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 these hunting expeditions, uh, power negotiation is done by men with neighboring bands. Also, when you the other important thing is when you hunt a big animal, a giraffe in England, the meat is shared in wide networks, sharing networks that are not only within the, uh, the nuclear family, as is a, a woman's gathering, um, uh, gathered resource, but amongst neighboring bands. So there is, what I'm saying, th there's power potential in the hunt, which can be activated to its fullest degree, especially if shamanism, by the way, shamanism, chance dancing, is very much linked to hunting too another story, <laughs> uh, which I go into in my, in Trixus and Chances. Um, so, 
that what I'm saying here is that the hunter in the socio-economic political sphere uh, has, even though there's egalitarianism, has a certain advantage over women, which in some Bushman societies is in fact quite marked, not amongst the Jumkwasi, but there are some uh, Bushman groups where you have uh, a fairly, um, where women are uh, not nearly as, as, as equal as men. But when we come to myth, and this is the point of the two articles here, Bush woman, the position of woman in Bushman society, and, uh, and the other one, um, is that uh, in myth, women are depicted as, ex as people who are very strong. In fact, there are some myths that feature only women, women living on their own without any men, and then they decide to get some men to hunt for them. <laughs> you know? And the men are fools because they don't know what to do with a certain weapon that suddenly becomes big and they, <laughs> they don't know where to put it. <laughs> the women have to give them cues, clues on how to, what to do. Men are sometimes buffoons in these tales, and women are resourceful and astute and strong. And Nisa, again, uh, women, the, the power of women in the kind of symbolic, ritual, mythical sphere, that comes out as well. And uh, I'm in, I've looked at Bushman myth, both the ones I collected, myself amongst the narrow, and also the Kham. I'll talk about the Kham again. The, the uh, Bushman uh, of, the, of the Cape, who left a huge, they left about 12,000 pages of, of, of record on, on in, in the 1870s on, that were collected by, by Wilhelm Blake and Lucy Lloyd. And I've gone into this record. That record is a bit what Rasmussen <laughs> maybe to, <laughs> to you, right? I've just, I'm just fascinated, I'm just reading. The Thule stuff? Oh, yeah. Anyway, um, so the bleak, so Bushman, the woman has a, a, a very, very uh, elevated status in, in Bushman myth, in Bushman stories. And uh, I, I, I have teased that out from the stories. And I see this as somehow counterbalancing the 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 power sur surfeit the the power advantage the man has in the techno the the uh, socioeconomic sphere as qua hunter is balanced out is equalized by woman who has uh, more of a prominent more of a profile more of a uh, more prominence and more more um, astuteness in, in, in the mess than 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 the men. That's the point I made in these two articles, yeah. And um, there's another paper here that's, that I want to, it's, it's about something different, uh, just quickly. Um, oh yeah, all right, then one other one. The, the San versus Bushman. You will have heard me use San and Bushman interchangeably. This has, a, there has been quite a bit of debate. It's still ongoing, although pretty well resolved now. Which of the terms should we use? And this, of course, is found in, in, in anthropology generally, the ethnonym. What, what do we call the, pe the people with whom we, and amongst whom we live, whom we try to understand and describe? Um, and oftentimes, there, this is a tricky business because, yeah, Inuit, for example, Eskimo. Uh, the same with Stan and Bushman. Yeah. Bushman is a Western term. It it's also has a bad history because Bushmen, Bushmanikin, as the Dutch called them, when the Dutch saw the Bushmen, they gave them that word because a few years before in Sumatra, they had encountered people in the forest, the orangutan. Orangutan is Malay for Bushmen. And then they simply transferred that word to what they thought was the African equivalent to the orangutan, that at least is uh, Lehmann. Lehmann is a German anthropologist who found that. I, I don't quite agree with it. But certainly, uh, Bushman has a bad history. 
and San was proposed by Richard Lee in the 1970s as a better word. But it too has, it's not a Bushman word for one thing, and it means vagabond and good, good for nothing, <laughs> good for not, you know. So it's not a good alternative either. 